Hey, Bridgeway. How you doing? So glad to see all of you. Can we give it up one more time for the Band of Brothers? There's something about hearing men's voices lifted in song, you know, that just as a woman, it just makes me feel protected. Do you know what I mean? Do you get that? Like men that love God, hey, nothing better. I married one. He's preaching over at the Columbia campus today. (laughs) So I have the privilege of speaking to you this morning about one of my favorite things, grace. And I need a lot of grace to talk to you about grace because grace, it's so big and deep and amazing. I barely know where to begin. So I'm going to begin. uh, One of the ways that I like to communicate is to tell stories true stories. And I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me, uh, gosh, about 20 years ago, all right? I was a 30-something. I got my key to my new apartment, and I was so excited about this. I was moving into this uh, Victorian house, and the apartment was the top floor of this uh, Victorian home in Catonsville, and um, it had a little deck on the roof, that was like up in the canopy of the trees. It was just absolutely dreamy, and I was so thrilled. There was only one problem. It was a bit of a mess. It had previously been rented by college students. Now, I love college students. I do. I love them, but their priorities are not about creating a beautiful home. They're getting the grades, you know? So I get it. So before I signed the lease, the uh, lovely homeowners, um, they took me upstairs to show me the place, and the college girls weren't home. Um, But I had to wade through a pile of clothes and beer cans and more clothes to just kind of like get a little tour. And I thought, "Mm, maybe this is a no. Maybe this is a little bit too much. But then they took me out on that rooftop deck. And I'm like, I'm done. I got to live here. This is the place for me. I was in love. Now, Frank and Julie the owners of this beautiful home. They're a sweet couple from Taiwan. And they said that I could paint and do whatever I wanted to make the apartment feel like home to me. And I thought, fantastic, I'm gonna fix this place up. I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna put a new carpet, I'm gonna make it beautiful. They are so lucky to have me renting their apartment. So the day I got the key, the very day I got the key, I'm headed over with some supplies and I was gonna paint before I move some stuff in. I'm very excited. I'm loaded down with things and I am going to go up the stairs with these things. Uh, I've got lots of things. I got buckets, I got a gallon of red paint. Red paint, because I had a vision. Right? I had a vision. So I'm, I'm going up the three-story stairwell, and I make it up the first landing. I'm, I'm rounding the landing and making it up to the, the second uh, stairwell. And something happened. Something happened that happens a lot to me. I tripped. <laughs> yeah. And so it was kind of like in slow motion where things jumped out of my arms in the air, you know? And I saw that gallon of paint just kind of jump in the air and hit the landing and I heard that sound, that awful sound, that yeah, red paint was set free from its tin can prison and it flew everywhere, all over the stairwell, it splattered on the banner, uh, banister, it splattered on the walls, it splattered on the carpet, it looked like someone had been assassinated in the stairwell, it was bad, really, really bad and I thought, wow, they're so lucky to have me. I was devastated, I mean devastated and and ready to burst into tears in an instant, just kind of standing there, not able to move, when just at that very moment, my new landlord, Julie, appeared in the stairwell, and she looked at the crime scene, (laughs) and then she looked at me, and she saw my face, and without missing a beat, she broke into this huge smile, and she said, don't worry. It's no problem. You got Picasso here. I can just add a little blue, add a little green, add a little yellow. It'll be beautiful. That is grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Anybody gotten any grace lately? Grace is getting favor, a blessing, a break. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve, judgment, punishment, death. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And thanks be to God in Christ Jesus, we get them both. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? 
I still get choked up telling people that story. And it's been like 20 years because I will never forget when it's somebody's first inclination to act like that, there's something deep that's going on, on inside their soul. She didn't even have to think about it. She just gave it to me. That's like the grace of God that just covers our messes. Today, I get to talk to you about my favorite thing, God's grace. And we're going to look at the life of Paul as we do it uh, in the book of Ephesians. But before we do, may I pray for us? Let's pray. God, we are always receiving so much grace. It's always. But we're not always perceiving the grace that we get. Lord, would you make us aware of how and where your grace is working? Help us to see it working in our lives and help us to live out our lives as people who know they've been given a great gift. I pray that your grace would accomplish your purposes in us and through us, all of us. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So you have been the recipient of this mysterious gift of, of God's grace? Yeah? Does that resonate with you? You've gotten some of that in your life? It's a beautiful thing. Here's a little grace quiz for you. When you are given a gift of favor through no merit of your own, it's all grace. When you made a mess and God doesn't reject you, but he promises he can make something beautiful with your mess, it's all grace. When you were excluded with no way to ever be reconciled to God and discover that he had a plan all along to bring you into his family, that's grace. It's all grace. When you've been a performer and an achiever all of your life, but you realize what you really need most is something that you can never earn, but something that you just need to receive, it's all grace. When you've been conditioned to hate certain groups of people your whole life, people who have inflicted pain on generations of people in your life. And suddenly, your heart is touched and changed to love them. It's all grace. Grace will mess you up. Grace will wake you up. Grace will lift you up. God's blessing and favor comes upon you in ways that you never saw coming. It'll make you forget about your resume, your pedigree, your entitlement, because grace isn't up to you, and it's not up to you to earn it. And grace isn't impressed, quite frankly, with anything about you, not with your looks, your heritage, your income, your education. Grace will make you breathe a sigh of relief when you get it. And it may challenge you to your very core when you see others get it. Grace is the most mysterious gift of God because you never know. You never know how or where it's going to manifest itself in your life. Sometimes it's an obvious material blessing that comes and you're like, wow, that ain't nothing but grace. You know, sometimes it just looks like favor, the kind of favor that everybody goes, wow, look at that favor. Sometimes it's like, wow, that great house that you got, that big raise, that job, or those answered prayers, very specifically answered the way that you were hoping. You know, prayers for healing, prayers for love, answered just the way you wanted. Grace, all grace. But sometimes grace works in ways that you did not ask for and that you did not want. A loss, a struggle, a trial a prayer that was not answered. You would not have called those things the unmerited favor of God, but even in these things, God's grace is always working in the life of a believer to accomplish his purposes in and through you. He is always good, and he is always working his good grace in your life. Amen? Amen. Always, always. And when you come out on the other side of that hard thing, And you come out stronger and wiser and more compassionate and with a peace and a joy that nobody can take from you. Only when you get to that other side, then maybe you'll say, wow, it was all grace. Now, God's first mysterious gift of grace that is kind of like the umbrella of of all other grace is something that we talked about when we shared communion together. And it's the gift of his grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gift of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, come to earth to show us how to live, to save us from what we deserved, right? Punishment for our sins, separation from God, death, 
The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus. And Jesus lived this perfect, sinless, beautiful life of love, and then he willingly laid down his life on the cross. It wasn't taken from him. He laid it down for us as a sacrifice for the payment of our sins. The perfect lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And through his blood, all of us who are dirty of our own merit, all of us are washed clean in the blood of Jesus. We're saved. We're reconciled to God. And we're now members of his family. And when we trust in Jesus, all of that sin burden, that weight that we were carrying was taken upon him. And all of his righteousness, this is so mysterious, all of his righteousness was exchanged and imparted to us so that when God the Father sees us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus all over us. And you look good. (laughs) We look good clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, don't we? We're credited with something that we didn't earn, the righteousness of Christ. What did we do to get such favor? Nothing. We believed what Christ did for us. It's all grace. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to camp out a little bit on Ephesians chapter 3. But I'm I'm kind of jumping all around in Ephesians a little bit. I just, I want to give you a little context and overview of the whole letter so that we can understand it a little better. This, man, this letter, Ephesians It's stunningly beautiful. And you can read the whole thing through like 15 to 20 minutes. And I really want to encourage you to do that. It would be a gift for your soul. That's my homework assignment, okay? Do yourself a great gift, a grace gift, and read through the book of Ephesians and just let it wash over you. It is amazing. Ephesians, it's like a handbook for the church, right? It's a letter about what it means to be a Jesus follower, what it means to be a Christian, and how to live it out in faith and practice, you know, what does it look like? What is God's idea of this holy community called the church? What should it be? What is essential doctrine and how do we live it out? Doctrine to duty. So that's Ephesians. It was written in about AD 60, AD 61 by the Apostle Paul, about the same time that he wrote Colossians and Philemon. And he wrote it from a great little writing spot where they've got fantastic coffee and just great atmosphere. (laughs) Now, he wrote it in prison. (laughs) Paul did a lot of really amazing things in prison. I don't know about you. When I have my quiet time with the Lord and I want to do a little writing, everything's got to be just perfect, you know? Got to have the candle glowing. Got to have the coffee in the mug. Everything's got to be just right. And like, now I can get into the spirit. No. (laughs) I look at Paul's life and I am just so blessed by how you could strip away everything of material worth in this man's life. And what emerges is a man whose focus and passion was Jesus Christ. And his passion also is for all of us who would believe in Jesus Christ. So there's Paul writing this letter in prison and he didn't write it just for the believers in Ephesians. As I was studying this, this kind of blew my mind. I didn't realize this. This is his most formal letter. It doesn't have personal references in it, even though Paul had pastored in Ephesus and he knew people there. He pastored there for a couple of years. Many had come to faith in Christ there. He didn't address people that he knew. He didn't address local church issues or local people. He wrote this letter as a letter for all believers in all the churches, and it was circulated around to all the churches. And so really, this is a letter for us, too. This is our letter. And to really appreciate how beautiful and amazing it is, can I tell you a little bit about who Paul is? Just a little bit about this man who wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament. He was a Jewish religious Pharisee with an impressive resume, a guy who you could say among the religious elite, he had it going on. So all kinds of reasons why he would be God's favorite, right? You'd think. He even writes these words about himself in uh, his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3. Paul said this. Paul said, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Whoa, (laughs) 
faultless. Talk about confidence in the flesh. Paul had it going on. And you know, here's the thing. The world really still operates in that kind of a system, doesn't it? Right? Confidence in the flesh, you know? It's a system of merit. We work to get what we want. We, we earn it. Or maybe we're born. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe we're born with beauty or privilege or, you know, maybe we follow all the rules and we do all the right things. And maybe we worked our way to the top. And because we did this, 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 and this, we have this great expectation that because of all we've done, everything should go well for us. You live a little bit of life and you realize the world doesn't work like that at all, right? <laughs> Not at all. But confidence in the flesh, it's this idea that somehow I deserve favor or promotion or recognition or good stuff because of who I am and how hard I've worked. So this is Paul, and this is probably us before Christ. Sometimes we even dip in there a little again, don't we? How does a guy like that, how does he go from having all of his confidence in his pedigree and his accomplishments and confidence in himself, how does he go from that to a man who said this just a little later in the same letter to the Philippians? He says this, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Whoa. Whoa, something crazy has happened to Paul, something very mysterious. Everything that was worth something to him before Christ, what does it mean to him now? Nothing, nothing. In fact, one of the translations, the original word, uh, that word for garbage, it's all garbage, it's all rubbish, is the word dung. He considers it dung, right? All that matters to Paul now is that he would know Christ be found in Christ and have the righteousness of God all over him, which comes from faith in Christ. In other words, no more confidence in the flesh. That season of life is over. It's all grace. It's all grace. That takes my breath away. And it challenges me, you know? Can I honestly say that all the things that I feel like I've worked for are dung? Well, I can tell you this. I can tell you that the sweetness of having a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ is better than any material thing you could ever put in my hands. I know that. I know that. And I ha you have to learn that, right? You don't always go, oh, okay. You have to learn that. And you realize just how near he is when you're hurting. You know, just how precious he is when other things are kind of stripped away. He's right there. It's all grace. There's a few things that grace does in the life of a believer. And I'm going to go through a couple of these for you. God's grace transforms us. God's grace transforms us. It changes us completely. Now, the Apostle Paul, he came to know that there was nothing in and of himself that was good enough to get him in right standing with God. He needed grace. He needed something other than his resume. He needed the unmerited, undeserved, blessing, ridiculous favor of God. Paul was like a religious rock star, you know? I mean, in his day, he was so fired up about the law and Jewish orthodoxy. He's on the front lines. He's persecuting Christians because he, along with other Jewish leaders, thought that Jesus' followers were subversive blasphemers. And they needed to be stopped. And Paul's on a mission to stop him. And Paul was very sincere. But Paul was sincerely wrong. Sincerity isn't enough. Paul was sincerely wrong. 
And God's grace, meeting him on that road to Damascus, blinding him and revealing to him that it's Jesus that he had been persecuting. An incredible transformation happens in Paul's life because of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Grace transforms us. We become spiritually alive, a new creation in Christ, not just an upgraded version of the old version. It's not like the iPhone. What are we on now? I don't know. 11? Are we on 11 now? How good is the 11? Is that pretty good? Is that pretty? Yeah. So it's not like it's the iPhone 12 that's going to be like so much better. It's like, no. When Paul says that we are a new creation in Christ, that word new, it's this form of this Greek word, kinos, which is a much different word. It's not an upgrade. It's like you are a new species, like the world has never seen before. That's, isn't that a wow? That's like, oh my goodness, you're brand new. Grace transforms us. I'd love to see it working in people's lives. Don't you love to see the transformation of someone who's come alive in Christ? Some of you are nodding. You have stories. You've seen amazing transformation. Maybe you've seen it in your own life and you have a story. Can I, you know, can I just say this? I, I love what's happened to Kanye West. I just, I just love it so much. <laughs> I just love it so much. You know, I mean, you can see him. He's lit up. Have you listened to his album, Jesus is King? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And he's got this, this passion to want to share the gospel. And, and, you know, when you hear people like, oh, is it real? I don't know if it's real. Listen, that's the wrong question. That's just the wrong question. It's not up to us to judge somebody else's faith journey. He's proclaiming Christ. He's wanting to share Christ. He's on a journey. You know, I'm, I'm like cheering him on, and he's talking about what Christ has done for him, and I'm like, yeah, Kanye, me too. Me too. We got a lot in common. And now we do. Now we do. We didn't before. Now we do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I love that. I love transformation. It's a beautiful thing to see people come alive in Christ. It's like they come alive knowing that they're precious to God. Paul was transformed by grace through Christ, a radical turnaround, a plot twist. He goes from being a persecutor of the church to a man who calls himself a servant of the gospel, a man whose sole mission is to share the mystery of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. Transformation. Grace transforms us from people who have confidence in the flesh to people who have all their confidence in Christ. That's the only reason I can stand up here today. I have confidence in Christ. Do you have confidence in who you are in Christ today? So grace transforms us. This is a work of of the grace of God in believers. Here's the second work of the grace of God in the life of a believer. God's grace secures us. It's about your identity. How many of you ever struggled with, am I really valuable? Am I really worth it? Am I really anything? I know a lot of people struggle with this. In fact, I think it's rampant. People that are dealing with anxiety, people that have pain, and they have all these questions, and they're wondering, God, do you see me? Do you really care for me, or am I just on the outside? No, God's grace secures us, secures us. If you're having an identity crisis right now, if you're struggling with issues of self-esteem, can I just talk to you just directly right now? You need to know who you are in Christ. Read the scripture over and over every single day. Let it wash over you with the truth. It's not flattery. It's the truth. None of us really need flattery. What we need is truth, and the truth about who you are in Christ is the stuff that helps you to lift your head. It's the stuff that gives you courage to go out there and live your best life. And so if that's you, I'm just going to, I just want to tell you about this, okay? Maybe like me, you've got a rap sheet of stuff that you've done you can't even believe that you did. I am not proud of my past. It's not pretty at all. And I need to be reminded sometimes of who I am. In Christ because that's behind me that's behind me Paul describes himself as the least of all the apostles and in another letter he calls himself the chief of sinners but I think maybe I might have him beat (laughs) so let me read this to you okay Paul you can just hear he's so overwhelmed with praise of God he's so overwhelmed with joy you hear it in his words see if you can catch all of the words that perfectly describe who we are in Christ 
according to God's grace in Christ, all right? I'm going to read to you Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Think about the words that describe who we are in Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, we are blessed, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. Through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely has given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory." And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. You were included. The gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who were God's possession to the praise of his glory. That's who you are in Christ. Amen. Amen. Did you get those words? Did you get them? Let me go through them again and just take them in. Say, I am blessed. I am chosen. I am holy and blameless in his sight. I am loved. I have been adopted because he wanted me. I've been redeemed. I've been forgiven. I have been purposed in Christ. I was part of God's plan. Yes, you were. I was included. I have been saved. I have been marked. I have been sealed. I am God's possession. I am God's child. To the praise of his glory. That's who you are. That's who you are. Doesn't it? Doesn't it, I want to say, doesn't it feel good to say what's true? It's so much better than flattery. It's so much better than, oh, you look good in that dress, girl. You know, it's, this is the stuff that matters. This is what we need to know about our value and our worth. Oh, my friends, read it over and over and over again. There is nothing that you can say to someone that is struggling with feelings of uh, no, low self-esteem and low self-image that could be any better than this. They need to know what God says about them, right? It's, it's a lot better than trying to make somebody feel better. There, there. I want to do the there, there, and then I want to get to the, this is the truth. This is the truth, okay? So God's grace transforms us. God's grace secures us. Here's another one. God's grace, this is kind of a double. I kind of stuck two together in this one. God's grace includes us and calls us out of our comfort zone. Ooh, God's grace includes us and calls us out of our comfort zone. In Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 12, Paul wrote these words. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, it's for you that I'm in prison, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into this mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery, he's going to tell us, let us in on a secret. Here it comes. This mystery is that through the gospel, Gentiles, all y'all, are heirs together with Israel, members together 
of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. You ever had a hard time sharing a blessing that you thought was just for you? I wonder how Paul, you know, the Hebrew of Hebrews, the Pharisee of Pharisees, who was once so proud of his status as a religious elite, one of God's chosen people, I wonder how it felt for him when he was given this revelation, this mystery of God's grace, that actually it's opened up for everybody. It's not just the Jews, it's for the Gentiles. It's for all of us. God made a way to include all of us. But he was one of God's special people. Now you, you're telling me I gotta share? I gotta share daddy with those people? Those non-Jewish people that were far from God, that oppressed my people over and over? They're part of the plan now? They get in? Really? Those people? Through Christ, Gentiles are included. And not only that, God reveals this to Paul, and then he says, and I want you to be the one to go and tell him. <laughs> I mean, can you just imagine, Paul, like what that might have felt like at first? Like, what, okay, okay, I, I get it, but now you want me to go tell them? But I'm the Jewish guy. Can I go talk to the Jewish people about you? No, actually, I want you to go to those people. There is such hostility such hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles, and now Paul is being sent to share the good news of the gospel of grace with the Gentiles. It's hard to share when you think something is just yours exclusively. In 2007, my father, Mark Tiernan, he called me up one day and he said, are you sitting down? I gotta tell you something. I'm like, oh gosh, what is this gonna be? Okay, I'm sitting down. And he proceeds to tell me, that I had a brother. <laughs> okay, I had a brother that I didn't know about. His name is Billy Baldwin, not the actor, not the actor. <laughs> that would be cool though, wouldn't it? But I had a brother who was uh, put up for adoption many, many years ago and was adopted by a lovely family out in California, raised by this family. And Billy had been on a journey looking for his biological family. And he found my father, his father, our father, he found him. And so my father was telling me about this on the phone and he was so excited. They had been having this uh, relationship that was developing by phone conversation. They'd been talking on the phone and getting to know one another. And my father was so excited, ecstatic to be reconnected to his son. And he's telling me about it. And I'm like, oh, that's great, that's great. You know, I was just inside, I was just kind of like, okay, well, you enjoy that. I didn't really think it had anything to do with me or for me. Fast forward to January of 2008. My father took ill. He ended up in ICU, and they told us that he was not going to make it. And I remember being in the cafeteria of the hospital in tears. I'm just, you know, trying to process this news that my father is about to die. And a few of my girlfriends were there with me and were processing and they're crying with me and then all of a sudden these words came out of my mouth and I said I wonder if I should call Billy and they said yes that's exactly what you need to do that's the right thing to do but I'm telling you no sooner did I say it that I just wanted to take those words back I just started backpedaling you know like whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute you know I don't want to call Billy I don't even know Billy. I'm not responsible for Billy. Why am I responsible for Billy? This is my father, my daddy. I'm grieving the loss of my daddy. He doesn't even know him. Why do I have to be the one to include him in this? This is about my grief, my pain, my process. And my friends were like, you got to call Billy. And I knew they were right. So after I had my little temper tantrum, I called Billy right there in the hospital cafeteria. About 12 hours later, he arrived at BWI from San Francisco. He had caught the first plane he could out of California so that he could make it to Baltimore in time to meet his father before his father passed away. I met him at the airport. This brother I had never met before. I was holding a sign. I made a sign on a big cardboard thing that said, Billy Baldwin, I'm your sister. <laughs> creative, right? And um, he saw me from a distance. He ran over to me. 
He threw his arms around me and he said, Tracy, you are the first person I have ever touched with my blood flowing through her veins. I was, I was so ashamed to think that I almost kept that from happening. It was like all of a sudden the, the clue phone was ringing and I picked it up. This was important. This wasn't about me saying this is my daddy. I'm not sharing. This was something bigger that God was doing. I took Billy over to the hospital and I opened the door to my father's room and I introduced my brother to our father. My brother who, excuse me, my father, um, he had been nonverbal for a little bit. He was kind of coming in and out of consciousness, but as soon as I opened the door and I brought Billy in, my father's eyes got so big. He knew immediately who it was, and he's hooked up to all this stuff, and he tries to sit up in bed and reach his arms out to Billy. <sighs> and then once again, I'm ashamed again. I realize, my gosh, this isn't just like an important thing for Billy. This was important to my father. And to think that my vile selfishness could have got in the way of this moment ever happening. It was a transforming moment in my life, to say the least. God's grace working. And it made me realize something. You know, we don't have a right. We don't have entitlement to the people in our lives, even to the blessings in our lives. You know, sometimes we are the very conduit that God wants to use to share the blessings that he puts in our hands with others. So we can't hoard them, no matter how personal they feel. Grace, grace is for us to share. Grace includes us and takes us out of our comfort zone. Here's the last one I wanna to share today. God's grace unites us. God's grace unites us. I'm going to read to you from the same letter, Ephesians, but from chapter 2, Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 18. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. Isn't that beautiful? Say, one new humanity. Oh my goodness. One new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, say one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, which he put to death their hostility. He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, Peace to you who those were who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. We both have access by one spirit. Now, when he says that, you know, Jesus came to destroy that dividing wall of hostility, that's not just a metaphor. When King Herod rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, he enclosed the outer court with these colonnades, these pillars. The large separated area was referred to as the court of the Gentiles because that's the only place that they were allowed to go. They were not allowed to go in any further than the outer court. And there were warning signs that were posted right there in Greek and Latin, letting the people know, letting the Gentiles know, you better not go in there. You can come here with your different cult cultures and, and religions and worship, but you can't go past here. You are not welcome. Some of the remains of these signs that were posted there to keep people out were discovered in Jerusalem in 1871. And this is what the inscription on the sign said. Are you ready for this? So imagine you're a Gentile 
probably most of us are, and we're hanging out in the outer court, and we think, you know, I want to get just a little closer. I want to get a little closer to God. And we come upon this sign that says, no foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. When Jesus saw that inscription, he had to know that it was only going to be uh, his own life that was going to pay the price for Gentiles to go past that barrier. Jesus destroyed the barrier between us and God, and he destroyed the barrier between us and us. And any wall that we erect of racism, of elitism, of oppression, it's sin. It's sin. In Christ, we are one body, one new humanity. The cross has torn down anything that has divided us, and it's always been God's plan that we would be together, that we would be members of one body with equal access to the Father through Christ. Don't you love that? Equal access. Everybody's included. It's all grace. It's all grace. Every human heart is desperately needing the grace of God to be reconciled to God and to each other, and it's available, and it's available. Jesus is the exclusive way to the Father, but he is the most inclusive one ever. He is the way, but he opened the way to all who would recognize their need for him and call on him. Bridgeway is a multicultural church, not because it's a cute idea, not because it's cool. It is cool, but it's cool because it's God's idea. It's God's idea that we would all be together, all of us, bringing our beautiful colors and cultures. We would be unified in our love, reaching the world for Christ together, members of one body. It's all grace. We all need it. We all have access to it, and we're all part of the same body. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? There used to be a saying around here, Bridgeway, um, back in the day, many years ago, our, our tech team, some of you that have been around for a while, you might remember this, but um, they used to call the tech team wired, right? The guys that would plug in the wires, you get that, right? Wired. And they had a saying and a t-shirt, they even made up a t-shirt, wired. We work so you don't have to. It was their way of serving the body of Christ right? Doing what they did so that you could come in and enjoy the service and connect with the Lord. Grace works so we don't have to. If you are exhausted today from just trying to keep all the plates in the air, from trying to keep everybody happy, I got good news for you. Grace is working. Grace is working so that you don't have to. You don't have to perform for God to like you. You know, you don't have to earn something that you've already been given in Christ. Some of us are exhausted because we're trying to earn what we already have. When you truly understand that all of it is grace, here's, here's a, a consequence that's really interesting to me. You don't get so offended because you realize the only reason I'm here and able to do what I'm doing is it's because of him. It's not because of me. Many Christmases ago, many Christmases ago, my friends and I had a little Christian band that formed from a Bible study. And uh, it was a beautiful time in my life, growing in the Lord with these wonderful relationships. And, and it just turned out that everybody could sing really well and play an instrument. And so we had our little Bible study that became a band. And our band was called Unveiled. And when it was brand new, brand new, I remember very specifically how thrilled I was that I got to be a part of that. Like, I was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. God picked me. I've been chosen. I'm not only a member of his family, but he wants me to sing for him and minister for him. And I was just completely undone, enthralled. Like, this is the most amazing thing ever. I can't believe it. So much so that when we got asked to do our first performance, if you will, at a church, it was on Christmas Eve, that's a big honor, right? And I was like, oh, God picked us to sing a Christmas Eve at this church. I was so excited. We got there early. We did our dress rehearsal. Everything went great. But after the dress rehearsal, sometime after, 
Mario, one of my brothers, one of the people I love the most in the world, one of my bandmates, he came over to me and he said, I gotta talk to you. I'm like, what's wrong? And he said, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm like, what, what's wrong, what is it? He said, some of the leaders of the church think that your dress is too short. And I'm like, it's like one of the longest ones I own. <laughs> Really? <laughs> and, but Mario was so concerned to hurt me because this was such a tender time in my life and I was so excited to serve God and he was afraid that by telling me this, I was going to get offended and turn away from the church. Well, I want to tell you, there was no way that anything was going to turn me away from what God was doing in my life and away from the church. I'm like, I don't care. What do you want me to wear? I'll put on a Smurf suit. I don't care. You know? To me, when you have an appropriate view of grace, as I did that many years ago, you're not easily offended because you know it's all for him and it's all because of him. I had to ask myself this question many times over the years. Would I still respond the same way? You know, if somebody said, hey, I don't like your high boots. Oh, yeah, well, don't look at them then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we are so offended. Maybe we just need to get reconnected. It's all grace. It's all grace. I don't want to get in anybody's way. If I've, God's going to allow me to be a, be a part of leading somebody to Christ, I'll do whatever it takes. I don't want to be a hindrance to God. It's all grace. And when you realize it's all grace, you go from performing to enjoying. Just enjoying being a child of God. You go from laboring to savoring every moment. Every moment. You go from trying to relying on his grace. You go from producing, got to keep it up, got to produce more. You go from producing to praying. You go from competing against other people that you think are in your way, other Christians. We are not in competition with one another, folks. We are brothers and sisters, one body. You go from competing to just receiving the grace that has been apportioned to you. When we realize how grace has been working in our lives, it transforms us. It secures us. It includes us and calls us from our comfort zone, and it unites us. And this is why we can say with every fiber of our being, like we really mean it and we know it to be true. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That's it, sing it out if you mean it. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just thank him. Thank him for his grace that he's poured out on your life all the days of your life. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Would you stand to your feet so that I can pray a blessing over you and send you on your way? God, we want to thank you, Lord, for your grace that's been working, working, working all of this time. God, would you make us aware? Keep us humble and grateful. Let us know, God, when we get off course. Thank you for the grace that shows us the way. Thank you for the grace that is like a mirror to show us who we are apart from you. God, I pray that your grace would, would work its transforming power in us and through us and that you would accomplish your purposes for every one of us, God. Let us be people who are giving you praise and glory and honor and enjoying being a child of God, lifting this weight up off of our shoulders. Thank you, God, for what you have done for every good thing in our lives, Lord. We know it's all grace. And it's in Jesus' name we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. And we say amen. 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 Thank you, God.
Thank you, God. You are dismissed. Remember, if you are in need of food, we would love to help meet that need. Check out our, our community cupboard and also Bridgeway in Five if you're here as a visitor and want to learn more about Bridgeway. Come to the back for Bridgeway in Five. Thank you all so much. God bless you.